Judah Turo Didn't Want to Be Famous by Audrey Addis, illustrated by Vivian Mildenberger. In 1801, the dawn of a new century, Judah Turo's heart pounded with the beat of adventure as he looked back at Boston Harbor. In the ship's hold were candles, soap, dried cod, rum, and dozens of other goods that would fill the little shop he dreamed of opening when he docked in New Orleans. The winds of possibility caught the sails of his ships. Judah was on his way but winds can be fickle, friends. As they swept over the northern waters, Judah's stomach tossed like the sea. While he was ill, thieves stole all his money. Cold and alone, Judah looked to the heavens. His father and grandfather had also sailed the seas. They left their homes to practice Judaism in peace and freedom. God had taken care of them. Judah knew God had a plan for him too. Five months later, Judah stood by the wood railings as his ship approached New Orleans. Squinting toward land, he saw a swirl of brown, black, and white-skinned people in brightly colored clothing. Judah chuckled softly and waved back to the children along the shore. What lifted his spirits was the sight of the busy harbor. A busy harbor meant trade, and trade was a business Judah knew well. Eager to begin his new life, Judah gathered his belongings and made his way through the bustling streets. Soon the bell over the door at number 27 Chartres Street was ringing all day long as townspeople stopped by to meet the newcomer, the newcomer and see what he had for sale. Judah welcomed them all. It wasn't long before he had many friends. Judah worked hard and his business boomed. But the most successful merchant in town, Judah was happy, but he wondered. His father and grandfather had been great rabbis. Had God planned for him to be a businessman? Judah had been in New Orleans for 11 years when the United States entered the War of 1812. Near the end of the war, when New Orleans was attacked by the British, General Andrew Jackson put out an urgent call for soldiers. Judah volunteered for one of the most dangerous jobs on the battlefield, bringing ammunition to the soldiers. One day while he was carrying gunpowder to the front lines, a 12 pound cannonball tore through his thigh. News of Judah's injury flew through the town. His, dare, his dearest friend, Resin Shepherd, a fellow merchant, searched for Judah through the smoke and chaos. No one expected Judah to live through the night, but several days later, Judah awoke in a warm bed with his friend watching over him. Both men's eyes lit up with joy and relief. Judah recovered at Resin's home for a full year before he was able to walk and return to work. While he lay in bed, he had plenty of time to think about why God had spared his life. Before the war, Judah had focused narrowly on his business. Now he opened his eyes wide to the city and the people around him. As he walked through the town, he shuddered to see his homeless neighbors huddled in alleys against the winter wind. His gut ached for the children who begged for food when they should have been in school. He sobbed for the families torn apart by diseases like yellow fever and cholera. Judah loved New Orleans. He imagined a city with modern hospitals and orphanages. He pictured safe housing, new schools, and a library. Judah looked to the heavens and smiled. He had enough money to provide all these things. So he did. Judah requested only one thing in return. He asked that his donations be kept secret. No ceremonies, no speeches, no pictures in the newspaper. Judah Turo didn't want to be famous. But Judah didn't always get his wish. Many of his gifts were so large that people found out about him. One day, Judah bought a church building in the center of town and donated it to a small congregation. He believed that everyone should have a place to pray. A wealthy businessman found out that Judah was the one who had donated the building and offered him twice what Judah had paid. The businessman wanted to fill the building with shops. Judah refused to sell. When Judah had first arrived in New Orleans, there were very few Jews and no synagogues. But by 1840, growing trade and the arrival of many immigrants from Europe had brought nearly 2,000 Jews to the city he now called home. The name Judah means praise, but the only thanks he ever accepted was when the rabbi invited him to open the ark when he prayed at the synagogue on Shabbat. 
Judah solved many problems with his money. There was one big problem he could not fix. From the time he was a boy, Judah had been taught that all people were equal in God's eyes. Every day, African men, women, and children were legally sold as slaves on the streets of New Orleans. Quietly, Judah began to pay off their masters. He felt honored to be able to help return enslaved people to freedom. Knowing that newly freed men had had to earn a living, he taught them about trade and often gave them money to start businesses of their own. Two weeks before he died in 1854, Judah wrote a will. He left his money to hospitals and orphanages. He made sure that fire departments, public parks, libraries, and schools could remain open and running. He donated to churches and synagogues in New Orleans, throughout the United States, and around the world. This plan made Judah happy. Over the course of his lifetime, Judah gave away more money than any other American of his time. But he was not famous, and that's just the way he wanted it.